meet lots of new folks here. I'm sorry if I haven't been able to spend time with everybody. I appreciate you shaking my hand, and hopefully before the day's over, we'll get to know more folks. Uh, give me just a moment here to get booted up and get everything going. We packed our printer away. I usually have printed notes, but unfortunately, I've got to rely on a piece of technology today, so maybe a little awkward, but I'll get through it. Um, we will be going to 1 Kings chapter 17 this morning. And while you're making your way there, I was thinking about a movie that I had seen. I don't want to date myself, but as soon as I mention this movie, I probably will. And this is not a promotion for any movie or even going to the cinemas or anything like that. But I remember as a kid watching this movie called The Karate Kid. <clears throat> now, this isn't the new one. This is the old one with Ralph, whatever his name is. And the story goes like this. His name is Daniel's son in the movie, Daniel. Mr. Miyagi called him Daniel's son. And he was a troubled young man, and he came across this old man named Mr. Miyagi. And he learned that Mr. Miyagi could teach him how to, how to do karate. I'm not sure if that's the right term for it. So he wanted to learn karate. So he got to know this Mr. Miyagi, and he would go to his house every day, and he basically said, teach me how to do karate. Well, what does Mr. Miyagi do? He puts, he shows him his car out back, this real nice car, he says, here. He gives him a, a wax pad and a buffer, and he says, do this. Wax on, right? And then wax off. Then he walks away, and Daniel's son says, okay, wax on, wax off. And after some time, he goes back to Mr. Miyagi, and he says, I thought you were going to teach me karate. What is with all this wax on, wax off stuff? And he just about gave up, right? And then Mr. Miyagi started doing these karate moves, and instinctively he did those wax on, wax off maneuvers, and he was able to do karate, and he didn't even realize it. The point is, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to Daniel why he was being asked to do what Mr. Miyagi wanted him to do. But Mr. Miyagi had a reason for it. He was teaching him something. He was bringing him along to where he wanted him to be, and it started with that very simple wax on, wax off. It didn't make sense, but it made sense later on when he was able to put that into practice. Well, that's sort of where I'm going today. God may ask us to do something in our life. And sometimes, it, well, more often than not, at least I've discovered, it doesn't always make sense. Why is God asking me to go this direction? Why is God asking me to do this? Why does God want me to do that? And it doesn't always make sense, but we got to understand God knows what he's doing. It may not make sense at the moment, but somewhere down the road, maybe not even this side of eternity, maybe on the other side of the Jordan River, we'll look back and say, oh, that's what God was doing. Now it makes sense. Well, there was a man named Elijah, and we'll get to that in just a moment. He was a prophet. You probably know the name. Now, Elijah, his ministry was partially during the reign of several kings. This, where we're going to read this account, happens during the king of Ahab, King Ahab. He was the king of the northern kingdom. You recall Israel was split into the north and the south kingdoms. Uh, well, during this time of his ministry, Ahab was king of the northern kingdom. Now, the Bible says regarding Ahab's father, his name was Omri. He said, of all the kings of Israel, Omri did worse than all the other kings of Israel. Pretty bad king. And then Omri dies, and his son Ahab takes the throne. And the Bible says about Ahab, he did worse than all the kings before him. So just when he thought things were bad, then Ahab does even worse. That seems to be the story of many of the kings of Israel and even the kings of Judah, the southern kingdom. Well, that's the backdrop for, for Elijah and his ministry was under this wicked king who married a wicked woman named Jezebel who wasn't even a, a Jewess. A Jewess. 
She was of a, of a Canaanite culture. Elijah had prophesied as a result of the wickedness of the king that there was going to be a drought and a famine. And there was such a severe drought that God said, uh, Elijah, I'm going to send you away to this, this brook, and it's called Kareth. Some of you may pronounce it Cherith. I'll call it Kareth. And he said, at that brook, I'm going to send a bird who's going to feed you. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> you mean to tell me a bird's going to feed me? Now, I don't, you know, I'm not a botanist or a, uh, what do you call the people that study animals? Uh, I know that I eat a lot more than a bird does. So Elijah must be thinking, how is a bird going to feed me? Okay, the water's there for me to drink, but God sent him to the brook, and he said, I'm going to send the bird to feed you. So God here is testing the faith of Elijah. Well, eventually the brook dries up. And God is going to send him somewhere else. And this is where we pick up the account. Look with me in verse number 8. 1 Kings 17, verse number 8. Now remember, the brook is just dried up. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. So I'm just going to do this narrative style. I'm going to read a little bit, then comment, then read a little bit. Uh, God knew the needs of Elijah. It's a very simple statement. God knows our needs. He knew the needs of Elijah. He knew that Elijah needed to be fed. He knew that Elijah needed water. Elijah didn't need to tell God. God knew. And so God says, okay, get up and go to Zarephath, and go to a widow woman, she's going to take care of you. Well, does a widow woman have the ability to take care of a full-grown man? We'll get to that in a moment, but notice that God knows our needs. Even though at the moment it may not make sense, God knows our needs, and he knew the needs of Elijah. Matthew 6 Verses 30 to 33 says, O ye of little faith, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God in all his righteousness. And then what does the Bible say after that? All these things shall be added unto you. We don't need to worry about how God's going to do it. All we need to worry about is putting our Heavenly Father first, and He knows the rest of our needs. He, he knew Elijah's needs. He was going to take care of him. Now, God's solution probably didn't make sense to Elijah. If I was Elijah, I, it wouldn't make sense to me. I mean, a raven, a bird, didn't, wouldn't have made sense to me at the time. If God were to tell me, uh, I want you to go somewhere, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring a little squirrel to feed you, or a little rabbit. Okay, Lord, but make sure he brings cheeseburgers and pizza and French fries. I, I really doubt that happened in Elijah's case, but Elijah trusted God when God said, "Just go there, and I will take care of you, and I'll use the most insignificant means possible, but I'll take care of you." Now God's telling Elijah that he needs to go somewhere else, but this time a widow is going to take care of him. Now, on the surface, that may not really seem like a big deal, but in ancient Israel culture, in ancient Middle Eastern culture, widows were not in a position typically to take care of people. As a matter of fact, more often than not, widows, if their husband died and left them without means, they were reduced to begging or to selling their children or some sort of extreme measure just to put food on their own table to feed themselves. And now God is saying, I'm going to use somebody like that to take care of you. So it's really no different than a bird. Something or somebody who seems so unlikely is going to take care of Elijah according to God. Faith is certainly required at this point. It would require faith of me if God were to tell me 
I want you to do something, go somewhere, or I want you to uh, have faith that I'm going to provide something for you, but, but then provide the most insignificant means to do it. More often than not, we say, well, Lord, I just don't know. Maybe I can do better if I try it on my own. But Elijah said, okay, I'm going to trust you, Lord. There was a man, his name was George Mueller. He was a great, I believe it was the, the 19th century, uh, one of the great 19th century preachers and evangelists in England. Uh, George, George Mueller had started, founded some orphanages in the, in the 19th century. And he was a man of faith, George Mueller was. He often would pray and then he would wait for God to provide the answer. What do we do? We try to provide the answer first and then pray that God would bless that. You, you know what George Mueller did on one occasion? The account goes this way that he was in an orphanage that he had founded. There were kids there. And he sat them all down to eat their evening meal, dinner. But there was no food. So what did he do? He prayed and he asked God to provide the meal and he sat the kids and the, the, the adult helpers around and he waited for God to answer. Well, sure enough, the account goes that a, a, a food truck, I'm not sure whether it was meat or bread, but it had broken down right in front of the, the orphanage. And rather than let the food spoil, whoever was driving that truck went up to the first door he found, which was the orphanage, knocked on the door and said, I've got this truck that's broken down. I've got all this food that's going to spoil. Could you use this food? Now, remember, he had just prayed, George Mueller, that God would provide their needs for dinner that night. That's the kind of faith that God requires. George Mueller said this, as long as I sought to serve the Lord, as long as I sought the kingdom of God and his righteousness, these my temporal wants would be added unto me. Words of the wise. So notice what Elijah does in verse number 10. He arose and he went to Zarephath. Very simply put, he arose and he went. If God is asking you or me to do something, do we arise and go or do we stop and question? Obedience is a first step toward faith. You know, it doesn't do any good to say I have faith and to so-called exercise that faith if I don't actually put feet to my faith. That's what Elijah did. It may not have made sense what God was asking him to do, but he went anyway. He put feet to, feet to it. James 2.14, what does it profit my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? James goes on to say, even so faith, if it have not works is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You know, that's not just about doing good works. That's about putting feet to our faith. That, that's about knowing that if God is asking us to do something, not just sitting around, but actually claiming God's promises in putting feet to our faith. Um, <clears throat> Elijah did not wait around. At least we don't have any record in Scripture that he waited when God said, go to Zarephath. What we have recorded here in Scripture is that he arose and he went. Immediate obedience. Y you know, we can wait around God asks us to do something, we can say, well, Lord, when I get time. You know, I, f I found there was a situation in my life where I felt the Lord leading me to do something, and I said, well, Lord, I'll get to it. And you know what? I waited and I waited, and the opportunity slipped away. And what I knew God was calling me to do, no longer, I waited too long, and the calling was no longer there. We can do the same thing. When God gives us a promise, we need to act on it. We don't need to wait around. When we were, here, here's an example. When we were in churches in the States, we were traveling all over the States in the ministry, and I would often tell people who would come up to me after the services 
And they would say, well, I feel God calling me to do this. And I would say, well, why aren't you doing it? Oh, well, you know, I've got a job and I'm waiting for this or that. No, if God is calling you to do something, there's no time to wait around. God already knows your needs. He knows the things that need to happen. And God knows his perfect timing. Elijah didn't question God either. At least we have no record of it. Elijah didn't say, well, God, I, I appreciate what you're saying. You want me to go here, and I know there's a widow, but Lord, wouldn't it make more sense if maybe you sent me to the king's house where there's bread and meat? Or, or, or Lord, wouldn't it make more sense if you sent me there or there? We, we don't have a question of that or a record of that in Scripture. What we have is that he arose and he went. Did you know that God's provisions often come after we make the first move? God makes a promise and we wait for the answer before we move. But more often than not, we go first because God is allowing us to evidence our faith first and then he steps in and he provides our needs. That's what he is doing for Elijah. Well, notice in verse 10, the second half, and when he came to the gate of the city. I've underlined the word, he came. Because not only did he obey God, but he has now arrived at where God told him to go. He came to the gate of the city. Now, what we're about to... What we're about to discover here is that an obedient faith, Elijah's obedient faith is not only going to bring a blessing to himself, but now God is also going to bless at least two other people because of his obedience, because of the fact that he was immediate and unquestioning in his faith. God took Elijah to that city so that he would meet the needs not of one, but of three people. You know, the same is true of us. It's not just about us. When God has given us an opportunity to exercise our faith, more often than not, you've heard of knocking out two birds with one stone. God may be knocking out a whole gaggle of geese with one stone. God works that way, doesn't he? He, he's, he's often blessing not just us, but he's blessing other people at the same time. <clears throat> and I'll just insert this one here for free. We've learned to accept the gifts of others. You know, when somebody comes to you and they say, you know, I just want to give you something, what do you do? No, no, you need that. Don't, you need that more than me. You know what we're doing? We're robbing that person of the blessing of giving. We've learned in the ministry that we have to put our pride aside and accept what other people do. It's humbling. It really is. Certainly we could use money and other things, but it humbles me to have to, re or to receive the gift from somebody else. But I know this, that God's going to bless them as much or even more than they're blessing me. You see what happens is when God is rewarding us, he often rewards other people in their faith as well. Um, we can rob others of their blessings when we ourselves don't act in faith. We rob other people. Now, it doesn't take much faith to obey when things are easy. It takes much more faith to... Uh, takes much more faith when things don't make sense. It's easy enough to pray to God, God, would you provide our needs and we have a job and... The money's coming in the bank. It's easy to pray that, is it not? But it's much more difficult to pray when we don't see the end, when we don't see how God's going to do it. When we're up against the wall, we're at the end of a rope, that's when God begins to work. That's when God began to work with Elijah. He didn't understand how. It didn't make sense. But that's where faith steps in. Remember the account of Abraham and Isaac? how that God had promised Abraham that he would provide through him the seed that would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore? How many legitimate children, sons, did he have? 
talked about this in Sunday school this morning. One legitimate son. He, he, he didn't have, well, at least at this point in his life, he didn't have a whole great big family. He had Ishmael, who was not God's promised. Then he had one son. His name was Isaac. It was through Isaac that God was going to bless Abraham. Well, what did God ask Abraham to do? He said, Abraham, I want you to go and kill your son. Take him up to a mountain, offer him up as a sacrifice, and kill him. Well, that didn't make a lot of sense. If I were Abraham, I, <laughs> I would hope I would have that faith, but certainly I might question the Lord in his sanity. Lord, do you know what you're doing? Don't you re remember you, you promised me that through my son you would bless me and you would give me as many uh, seed as the sand on the seashore? Well, Abraham, even though it may not have made sense, what did he do? He took Isaac and he obeyed God and he took him to the mountain and he tied him down and he pulled up the knife and he was ready to slay him. And then God rewarded his faith. He held his hand back. He provided a sacrifice in the bushes and he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. You see, it didn't make sense at the time but God still rewarded his faith. The same was true with us. Faith must come at a personal cost. More often than not, faith is more than just praying and just waiting for God. God is asking us to step out of our comfort zone to possibly do something that may not make sense and might actually cost us something. He might even ask us to, to give of something that we don't have to give. But you know what? If God asks us to do it, he's going to provide the means. Uh, verse number 10. Behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Uh, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, that would have been easy enough for a poor widow woman who probably didn't have means to take care of herself. Uh, she could easily go and draw water from the well or wherever it was that she was going to draw water. Fact is, she may have even been expecting a financial reward for give, bringing water to this man. May, maybe in her state, she thought, well, if I go and provide water, maybe he'll give me something in return for that. The water would only have cost her effort but Elijah, or God, doesn't stop there. And, and as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Uh-oh. Yeah, there's plenty of water, but all she had was a little bit of bread. See, God is now beginning to really test her faith. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. You see where she's at? She just has just enough food just to cover one little meal. In fact, that's all she's got. She says, once we finish this, we've got nothing else to, to live on. We're going to die. And yet the prophet is saying, I want you to give me that. Give me that. God's going to give you, but first you have to give me that. The food came at a personal sacrifice. You, you know, it, it was easy enough to, to trust God and bring water to the prophet because there was water aplenty, at least where she was. But now God is saying, I want you to sacrifice. I want you to take of something that is going to cost you dearly. And when you do that, I'm going to reward you for that. Would it really be faith if it was something that we could do ourselves? I mean, really. Would, would it really be faith to ask God, God, would you sustain my car for the day? Well, God may do that. And I believe that day by day, God sustains our needs. But where does faith step in? When, when God asks us to do something, and we know that if God does not provide that's it for us. We've got nothing else. 
You remember the woman with the two mites in the New Testament? That was all she had. Maybe in an area of your life, such as finances, God may be saying, I want you to trust me with your finances. But first, I, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And, and I'm not going to go there, but you know where I'm going. God may be asking you to trust him with your finances. And you say, but Lord, you know, you, you know where I'm at. God says, yes, I do know where you're at. But you need to trust me. You need to believe. And by faith, I will provide for you. Maybe it's in an area of health. You know, there's a lot of health issues here in Australia. We found being in the church so many difficulties when it comes to health. Possibly it's in your job or even in relationships. What, what if somebody's done you wrong and God says, I want you to go and I want you to forgive that person? Wow, Lord. <laughs> You know what they did to me. Yes, the Lord knows what they did to you. Oh, but you don't really know. Yes, the Lord really knows. But God is asking you to do something that's beyond yourself because God is going to reward you for that. That's a very real situation that we found ourselves in. Here's what happens when we do that. God will begin stripping away our means little by little until all we have left is to look to him. You know where real faith steps in in life? It's not where we can have a plan B, where if God doesn't step in, then we can have something else to fall back on. You know when we have that attitude, if God, I want to ask God, but, but if he doesn't, at least I've got this plan B. No, faith is where God strips away that plan B and that plan C and that plan X, Y, Z. It says, now I want you to do this and I want you to trust in me. Have you been there? We've been there a couple of times where we have no other backup and God says, now I've got you or I want you. Put your faith in me and God will reward for that. But the problem is many will fall short of victory in their lives because just when God brings them to that point where it says, now I've stripped away your means, all you need to do is take that final step of faith. People say, I just can't do it. I, just, I, I don't have the faith to do it. And they turn around and they, they go the other way. And God will not reward that. There was a blind man in John chapter 9. Now, you don't, need, you don't have to turn there, but I'll, I'll paraphrase this for you. And if I skip a few steps, I apologize. I'll try to get the gist of this. Jesus had come across a man who was blind from birth. And the man had no other means probably but to beg because he couldn't see. And Jesus had an encounter with this blind man. He anointed his eyes and said, I want you to go and I want you to go and wash in this place called the Pool of Siloam. And the man, having his eyes anointed, did what Jesus said. He went and he washed. And the Bible said he came back and he could see. And no doubt, I believe he could see with 20-20 vision. Well, along came the Pharisees who had made an agreement. And they said, if we can, can, if we can get one person to confess the name of Jesus, we're going to kick him out of the synagogue. We're going to nip this whole Jesus thing in the bud. Well, they found out about this man that Jesus had healed and had caused to see. And they began to ask him, this blind man, about Jesus and called Jesus a sinner. And the man said, whether he be a sinner or no, all I know is this. I was once blind, but now I, could, I can see. And they began to press the man about Jesus. And finally, the man said, you know what? If he were not of God, he could not have done these things. He all, but, well, he did confess the name of Jesus. He was faced with this decision. I can either keep my mouth shut and remain in the synagogue, or I can confess the name of Jesus, knowing that if I get kicked out of the synagogue, there goes my means of support. There goes my ability to buy and sell in this community. There goes my family. There goes everything. And what did he do? 
He said, all I know is this man could not have done this if he were not of God. He confessed the name of Jesus. And I have no doubt that God took care of him. God rewarded him for doing that. You see, that's where faith is. It cost him something. It cost him uh, his so-called reputation in his community, but God rewarded him for that. God will get the glory when we do that. If we have a plan B, if we have a backup, we, we don't give God the glory. We give ourselves the glory because we could say, well, God did it, but actually I stepped in and helped God out a little bit. But when we don't do that, God gets the glory. God wants to be proven. Did you know that? Did you know that God wants to be proven in your life? Well, now, doesn't the Bible say we're not supposed to test the Lord? Uh, well, no, we don't test God to do the wrong thing, but we certainly uh, prove God when it comes to his promises. God has promised us that when we step out by faith that God will reward that. And I believe God wants to be proven. Uh, the great example of that we find in Malachi chapter 3 where God says, bring your tithes into the storehouse. Prove me herewith and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you don't even have enough room to store. Well, does that mean that God's going to make us rich? No. Does that mean that, that God's going to give us an abundance of needs? Probably not. But God's storehouses and his blessings are different than ours. God will provide if we step out in faith. The widow was at the point where if God did not miraculously provide, then she and her son would die. She had no choice. She had no plan B. She had no backup but to trust the Lord. You know, you may remember Elijah, just I believe it's a few chapters beyond where we're at now, how that Elijah had gone to the prophets of Baal. And God had said, I want all the prophets of Baal to meet me up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, I believe it was. And he said, here's what I want to happen. I want all the prophets of Baal, you can all get together together and, and be around one altar, but you're going to build an altar and you're going to cut up a, an animal, put it on the altar, and then I want you to call upon your God to send fire down and consume the sacrifice. And he said, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to build an altar, and we'll see whose God is the real God. Now, if I were Elijah, I would be thinking, I have no plan B. If God doesn't show up, I'm going to look like a fool here. But Elijah had the faith in God to say, God, you've got to show up because I'm putting you to the test. I'm proving you in front of all these prophets of Baal. And God, if you don't show up, I'm going to look like a fool. You're going to look like a false god. And I believe that God wanted to be in that position for Elijah. What did God do? Well, the prophets of Baal, they cut themselves, they cried out to God, and they did all these ridiculous things. And Elijah even said, well, your God must be in a conversation. Maybe he's taking a journey. Maybe he's walking with, taking, taking a walk somewhere. He was making fun of them, really. And after all that they did, they could not get their God to, to consume the sacrifice because there, there really was no God. And then it came to Elijah's turn. And Elijah began to pray. But before he prayed, he said, I want to cover the sacrifice with water. So much water that it fills the, the, the trench that I've built around the altar. So not only is God going to have to come through, but he's going to have to come through uh, beyond the circumstances that, that I had set up for the other prophets. Well, the Bible says that God honored that. The fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, consumed even the dirt on the ground and the wood and all around it. See, the point is, <clears throat> Elijah put God in a position where God had to come through. There was no plan B. There, there was no uh, blowtorch hiding in the bushes that if God didn't come through, he could kind of make it look like God consumed the sacrifice. God had to come through, and God rewarded that faith by coming through for Elijah. I believe God wants to be in that position with you and I today. 
when God is calling upon us to exercise faith, he's not looking for a plan B or a plan C or anything like that. He wants us in a position where only he can come through and he can get the glory for it. <clears throat> Verse number 13 of our passage. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. See, she's got the promise now. If you provide God first, then God is going to not allow the barrel of meal nor the cruise of oil to fail. She's got the promise of God. If she obeys, then God will provide. Oh, the situation seems impossible, but she's got the promise of God. You know we have God's promise today that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We, we have the promise that if we seek the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, that he'll provide food and clothing for us. There was a story of a man who was washed in the desert. He was just at the brink of dying of thirst. And then he comes upon this well in a, maybe an oasis there in the desert. And the well went all the way down to clear spring waters way below the desert. And when he approached the well, he saw there was a bucket there with a rope going around the spindle. And tied to the rope was a bottle of water and a note. Well, he read the note, and the note said, uh, this bottle of water is from the water down below. It's clear spring water. But don't drink the water from the bottle. The bottle is there to water the rope because, see, if you try to lift up a bucket of water, the rope is going to break because it's too brittle. But if you use the water in the bottle first to wet the rope, then you'll be able to lower the bucket down and you can draw as much water as you need. See, the man had a choice to make. He could either satiate that thirst with that bottle and that would be it, or he could, by faith, trust what that note said and he could wet the rope. And sure enough, he did that and he was able to draw as much water as he needed. You see, God's going to provide even if the situation seems impossible. We simply need to trust. But here's the thing. There was no assurances through disobedience, only through obedience. When we obey God, God is bound to come through with his promise. But when we disobey, God is not bound to do so. Oh, he may. He may be patient and long-suffering with us, but we don't have the assurance that if we're disobedient, that God's going to provide for us. He's going to take care of us. When we put God first with our substance, the barrel of meal will not waste. Notice this, that in verse number 13, who, who did the woman feed first? Did she feed herself and then the prophet? No. She fed the prophet first, and then she was able to feed herself. Well, how could she do that? Because all she had was enough food for herself for one meal and her son. Well, doubtless, when she fed the prophet, that was all she had. Somewhere between the time that she fed that prophet and she fed herself, God had replenished that cruise of oil in the barrel of meal. I would have loved to have seen that. How, how would that, you know, how, just to see the, 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 the oil just miraculously come back up and to see where there was no meal to see it just reappear. I don't know if God did that. I don't know how God works, but that would be interesting. Verse number 15 says, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Um... The promise here was not that the barrel or the cruise would be full, but that they would not go empty. Did you catch that? God, God provides what we need daily. 
He doesn't provide at times what we need monthly or yearly. He, he provides what we need day by day. And that's, you know what, if you don't have faith, that's a hard way to live because we're looking to ourselves and our own meager abilities to provide. But what God does, and what God does here, is he gave them just what they needed for the day. Matthew 6.34 says, Take therefore no thought to, for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take care, uh, sorry, for the morrow shall take care, shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We're to be concerned about today, not just our needs, but about God. Lord, how can I today, how can I exercise my faith in, in such a way that you will take care of my daily needs? Tomorrow is another day. Now, this isn't a message about saving up for the future and that sort of thing. But what we need to worry about is today, the here, and the now. There was just enough in the barrel, in the cruise, each day for their daily needs. And it might be so for you today. You, you may have just enough today for your daily needs. And I'm confident that by faith, when you place your faith in the Lord daily, that he will take care of your daily needs. He's promised to do so. And to do anything less would make the Lord a liar. Let me give you a few final thoughts here. God oftentimes uses the, the weak things to prove himself. Uh, he doesn't use people with charisma oftentimes. Sometimes he does, but more often than not, he uses those who are weak. He uses the little things to take care of the big things. He takes things that are abased and he lifts them up. It's a dichotomy. It's a paradox the way God works. He doesn't use the strong. He uses the weak. Because in doing so, he gives himself the glory when he does that. Don't ever think that in your own strength, somehow you have what it takes in this life. Remember that God is the, the, he is the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need your strength. He doesn't need your abilities. He just needs your faith in him. Trusting in the Lord becomes an opportunity to worship rather than to doubt and to fear. Remember I said that oftentimes people get to that precipice in their life where God has stripped away all of their means and abilities, and rather than stepping across that threshold by faith, they turn their back on the Lord, and they go the other way, and they live a life that says God could not have done that when they didn't give God the chance. But rather... Stepping across the threshold, it becomes an opportunity not only to allow God to work, but to worship Him. You know where true worship is? It's where God is. And sometimes God is over that line on the other side, not on our side. And He's waiting for us to step across by faith. God, number three, is aware of your needs. Um, David said this in Psalm 37, I have been young and now I am old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now, I'm not saying that that is an absolute truth of Scripture, but there is certainly a principle here that uh, those who are righteous, who seek the Lord, God is going to provide for them. Well, what about that person that God didn't provide? Well, God may be dealing with that person in a different way. But God will always provide for those of us who seek him by faith. But let me give you one final principle here. Just because your situation may seem impossible does not mean that God isn't at work in your life. Well, God doesn't know... The, he doesn't understand where I'm at. Yes, he does. I may not understand, and I may not be able to be in your shoes and identify with where you're at, but he knows, and he understands. You know what the Bible says about Jesus? He's been through every temptation we can ever endure, and yet he never sinned. He can identify with every difficult situation that you and I could ever conceive and more. He can identify He's been there, and he's been victorious. That's what God wants for you and I. That's the bottom line of this message. When we obey God, when he doesn't make sense to us, it's because 
He wants you and I to be victorious. God desires you and I as Christians to have an abundant, victorious life, to live as more than conquerors. We're not to be defeated Christians, but we're to conquer. Well, let me ask you this question in closing then. Do you have a situation in your life that seems impossible? I, I can certainly look back and say that we've seen God come through some very difficult, if not impossible, circumstances. Maybe you have something in your life where you say God is the only one that can come through because I'm at the end of my rope. There's no other way that I can uh, allow this in my life to happen or provide unless God comes through. Why not right here now say, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I don't know how you're going to do it. It may, like I say, it may be a financial issue. It may be a health issue. It could be a relationship. It could be a job. It could be a number of things. But you see no other way unless God steps in. Why not say, Lord, I'm going to trust you right here and now. I don't know how you're going to do it, but Lord, I'm going to give you my faith. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't even know Jesus Christ. God may in his long suffering be dealing with your heart. You know who you are. I, if I were to say right now, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, you would find your home in heaven? Your answer could possibly be, well, uh, you know, I'm a good person. I, I go to church every now and then. I try to be better than the, the next guy. Well, the truth of the matter is, in God's eyes, you're falling far short of his, perfect, her, his holy perfection. It's not compares compared to the next person, but as compared to God, you've been found short. And the Bible says you must be born again. Trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, who was able to save you from your sins because you're un unable to do that for yourself. Maybe you're like that this morning. We're going to have just a brief invitation. I'm going to let Pastor do it. But I'm going to ask you to stand right now with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Um, we'll have a hymn played this morning. Sorry, I should have warned you. Um, but I want to remind you this morning of the idea that God can provide for your needs if you put your trust in Him. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord is your personal Savior, why not make it today? Why not make this today that you put your trust and faith in God and begin that process by which, by faith, you walk and allow God to take care of your needs.